It's been around for a good while, but we have been told by no doubt some well-meaning brethren that Christians really do not need to pray to God for Him to forgive them of their sins. It is usually the Scripture, 1 John 1 verse 7, that is used as a supposed proof text to prove that point. But it's a misunderstanding of what's said in 1 John 1 7 to conclude that. Obviously, 1 John 1 and verse 7, John writes, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. This passage, among other things, teaches Christ's blood does continually. That's the force, if you've heard me say many times, of the Greek present tense. Continually cleanses the faithful. I keep that in mind. Cleanses the faithful person from the faithful person's sins. But you've got to say, what does being faithful include? And that's what they tend to overlook. These brethren have forgotten that in properly studying a topic, You've got to take all of what the Bible says in its context before you draw your conclusion. The view that Christians do not need to pray for God to forgive them of their sins is an example of people taking part of what's there to the exclusion of other things. I mentioned that they're well-meaning. I don't doubt they're well-meaning. I don't doubt that they're sincere. Because you can be well-meaning and be wrong. Paul was. You can be sincere in what you do and be wrong. That uh, old saying that the road to somewhere is paved with good intentions is meant to say that you've got to have the good intentions. You've got to be sincere. You've got to be well-meaning. But you've got to be right. That's a very important point. Remember that Jacob had his brothers who wanted to get rid of Joseph sell him into slavery. And they brought the coat of many colors, rent and dipped in a kid's blood, and told their father that some animal had gotten him. And for years and years and years, he sincerely believed that the boy was dead, but he wasn't. So that shows you again how you can be very sincere, very honest in your belief, but what you're believing is just not the truth. We all need to be careful about that. And that's something that should be a force in us to drive us to be sure we do the necessary study and that we're honest of heart to make sure we are right. God knows that we can be right. He knows we can understand His will. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. If we cannot know the truth, if we cannot know by the truth that we're right and therefore know what is wrong, then that's a big lie that Jesus told in John 8, 31 and 32. Well, let's ask the question now regarding 1 John 1, verse 7, what it means to walk in the light. Some years ago, in fact, it's now well over 30 years ago, I was in a preacher's meeting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with a whole bunch of liberals. Marvin Phillips was there, and he had taught. Some of you don't know who that is, but he was a fantastic liberal <laughs> of those days um, he was teaching this very point some of us had taken issue with him so I said well I believe where you have the Bible when I got a chance to speak commenting on itself you have an inspired commentary and there's no use for us to wonder because God's told us what it meant and I said right at the beginning of the church in Acts 2 and a passage everybody here knows is quoted many times that the church continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine that ought to tell us something and here's why how is it that you can walk in the light since this letter John wrote is written to Christians how is it you can walk in the light and not continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrine How is it that you continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and not be walking in the light? I said, does that not teach us that to walk in the light 
is to walk according to the teachings of the apostles because they were inspired of the Holy Spirit to write down the will of Jesus Christ. I didn't think that was too tough, but it didn't set well with that group. But it's so simple. Maybe that's the reason it didn't set well. Let me say again, when you have an inspired scripture that is giving us the meaning of another scripture, you can't get any better than that. That's God telling you what the passage says. Part of right and dividing the word of truth of which we talked about this morning. 2 Timothy 2.15. So since neither one of us, any of us, if we know our Bible is interested in doing it because it's the word of God, we know the Bible doesn't contradict itself. So how is it that a person could continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and not be walking in the light? Or how is it that one walks in the light, lives in the light of the truth, and not be continuing steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. So we have continual forgiveness, but only so long as we walk in the light, which means what? That we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, part of that light, a part of the doctrine of the apostles, a part of the New Testament teaching, reveals to us that we are to petition God for forgiveness, which those who teach this erroneous doctrine have failed to see, although it's laid out directly before them in 1 John 1 and verse 7. If you walk in the light, is if you walk as the light of God's Word instructs you, please realize that I'm not questioning such brethren's sincerity in believing this error, but nevertheless is error. I've said, I think, that already concerning sincerity in error. But clearly those who teach the doctrine are not praying to God for their own forgiveness because they don't believe they need to. But remember, when we say, I don't believe I ought to do this or I believe I ought to do that or I believe it ought to be done a certain way, since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, what I'm saying is the Bible teaches what I believe. Now, would you want to say, I believe this, and then turn around and say, well, I don't know where you find that in the Bible. That's what people do all the time. They give lip service to the Bible as the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final, and complete revelation of God's will. Then they turn right around and say, oh, isn't it a wonderful book? Aren't we glad we have God's Word? Then they don't do what it says. <laughs> and that's a sad situation. It, it simply goes down to the point that we don't realize what we're saying when we say, well, I believe God this and I believe God that. Or I believe it's part of being a Christian to do this. When you say you believe it and faith comes by hearing the word of God, then you're saying the Bible teaches it. That's why we're going to be judged by the Bible. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you the last day. When Paul said, for we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. He's saying we walk as the Bible instructs us, teaches us, leads us, guides us, commands us. To do. That's what it means to walk by faith. That's why you can hear uh, from Ecclesiastes 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Is it not the whole duty of man to have an accurate faith in God and Christ, the Bible and the gospel? Yes. Well, that means you keep His commandments. You do what's authorized. You only do what's authorized by Jesus Christ and His Word. Again, Colossians 3.17. Again, Understand that the Greek present tense is not our present tense in English. That's one of the problems you run into in trying to render from the Greek into English exactly in English what's said in the Greek. It means you keep on keeping on. Now, in other places in English, due to the nature of what's being translated and taught, then you know you don't do it a while and stop. You know you don't study your Bible today and not study it anymore. You know that Bible study enjoined upon man by God is a perpetual thing. So you can determine that by just the English in other ways. But you don't have to worry about that in Greek. When they said it, they understood this begins here and never stops. So Matthew 7 and verse 7. Ask it shall be given you, seeking you shall find, not shall be opened unto you. That's Greek present tenses. You never stop asking. You never stop knocking. And so on. That's the person that will learn the truth that he's seeking. And so it is here, this walking in the light is a continual thing. 
It never stops. But part of that walking in the light is continue to study. To continue to do what God said do, to be faithful to Him. It's just that way. So it, it can be, that is, this, this can denote a sustained activity. And that's the point we're making. It's part of what's said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, which we quote most often. And the reason we do it is because it says there in English what the Greek tense does if you knew Greek. Well, how many of you all walk around speaking Greek every day? Mark was talking earlier before services, and I said, well, one reason you don't hear me say much about Greek except to in the tenses or just the meaning of a word is because while the Greek was, is the language God saw fit to give us the New Testament, it's obvious he intended translations to be around. Because right on the day the church started, the Holy Spirit gave them infallible translations. How here we speak every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. And they spake as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, and they heard them speaking the wonderful works of God. Well, if they heard in every language wherein that whole big group was born, it lists all of them there, they were hearing it in language other than Greek, and that was the day the church started, and the gospel was preached in all those different languages. I thought I would tell somebody something if they would uh, think just a little bit. So sometimes it can mean two intermittent activity, and sometimes we show not, not the punctiliar case, but inter in, intermittent, it means dot, 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 not just a straight line. Well, what, what all does that have to do with anything? It means either way you do it, it keeps going on. It keeps going on. You walk in the light. When? Today? And not walk in the light anymore until next Sunday? No. You walk in the light. You follow the teaching of the apostles' doctrine. You study your Bible. You pray. You do the things it says every day of the week, all day long, all the time. And that's what it means, be thou faithful unto death. You're faithful all the way to where even if you must die rather than become unfaithful, you die. Now with us, a lot of times, that's simply getting old enough to kick the bucket and you stay faithful to that happens whether you're 35 or 95. But nevertheless, either way, you stay faithful all your life. So that's a point that sometimes people fail to realize. But being faithful is doing all the detailed matters that God says a Christian ought to do. That's what it is to walk in the light as he is in the light. So does the Apostle John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing part of the New Testament of the Christ, imply unconditional forgiveness independent of prayer? No, he does not. There's too much said in the New Testament about the Christian continuing instantly in prayer. Will that mean he walks around muttering all the time to God? No, it means it's a regular part of his life. It never ceases to be a regular part of his life. It continues on. When people lead us in public prayer in the worship assembly, most of the time they end their prayers asking for forgiveness of sins. Well, does that mean they couldn't live one minute without committing a specific sin? Or that they sinned walking up the aisle before they got here to lead us in prayer. And we all sinned in the process of them praying or just before they prayed. So we have to ask forgiveness. What, is it, what it acknowledges, and this is what people don't understand. What this acknowledges is that we are prone to sin. Man is prone to sin. Man is prone to break God's will. Now watch this further down here and you'll see this in verses 8, 9, and 10 of 1 John. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Does that mean that a person cannot live one minute or one second without transgressing God's law in mind or word or action? No. It just means that we are always acknowledging the fact that we need the mercy and grace of God through the gospel all the time. Besides that, there can be sins of ignorance. What does that mean? I haven't grown to understand that by doing this, I sin or leaving this undone. And I guarantee you a lot more of those sins are sins of omission. We didn't know we were supposed to be doing that. Have you ever come across somebody? They've been a member of the church for a while and you study with them. And they say, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize I was supposed to be doing that. Well, let me ask you something. What was keeping them ready to go to heaven all that time? Because they were in the realm of grace, having been baptized for the mission of sins, and having resolved previous to their baptism to repent of their sins. They're going to spend the whole rest of their life learning and doing better by changing their ways to fit the truth when they learn it. Unless you want to try to say that as soon as a person comes up out of the water grave of baptism, he knows all the Bible he ever needs to know, and he has all the experience he ever needs to have. 
Well, that's ridiculous because explicitly the Bible says we're babes in Christ. Whether we're baptized at 15 or 30 or 50, we're babes in Christ spiritually. So it's obvious then that one must be baptized into Christ to get into a state of favor with God so you can grow up and get better. But no person who wants to be faithful to God is going to see a sin in his life and say, who cares? I'm covered by the grace of God. <laughs> that won't work. When you see sin in your life, you readily repent of it and confess it because you're a child of God. You want to serve Him. You're glad to get rid of it. You hate sin. Yet, you must always be confessing that I'm prone to sin. There may be something in my life I don't see. Please forgive me. Because I promise you many people who pray, as Christians now, I'm not talking about people outside of Christ who need to obey the gospel, who are still in their alien sins to separate from God. I'm talking about those in Christ who have a right to pray and call God their Father. They're always praying to know more. You ever pray to know more? You ever pray to be stronger? You ever pray for the forgiveness of sins, not having a specific sin in mind, but because you know you're prone to sin? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, that's got to harmonize with verse 7. So how can I draw from verse 7 that you don't have to pray to God specifically for forgiveness of sins? If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and the truth is the Word is not in us. So uh, we've got to understand that. It all fits. It's trying to teach us that I'm keenly aware of the fact that I need God. I need His mercy. I need His grace. I need His Word. I need to be more vigilant in knowing the truth. And just because I've been baptized and my alien sins are remitted and I'm in a state of grace having been baptized into Christ where God's located every spiritual blessing in, every, in, in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3, that means I'm still aware of my weakness. How are you going to grow, folks, in greater knowledge of the Word of God and in greater practice of the Word of God if you aren't looking for your weak points? Tell me, how do you grow? How do you get better? What's the purpose of examining ourselves to see whether we be in the faith? That was written to Christians, you know. Except that it's an effort on our part to constantly weed out those things in our lives that are contrary to God's will. Think better thoughts. Have you ever sung the song, Pure in Heart, O oh God, Help Me to Be, that I, Thy Holy Face, some day may see? Do you realize the prayer you're praying in song at that time? Pure in heart. That means you're pure in heart, but you sure would like to be more pure <laughs> or purer. <laughs> That's what you're asking for, to be better. So that's one reason that we're constantly aware of the fact that man, though we're redeemed, though we're a child of God, though we're covered by the blood of Christ, we're aware of our need to have a tender conscience, easily pricked by the word when we see that we do sin, and a hungry and thirsting after righteousness that didn't just exist in us to make us Christians, but continues to grow after we are Christians. Now if you look to God's model prayer, that is the model prayer that uh, his son gave us in Matthew chapter 6. You'll see that is a model. And that means it's a pattern to follow. We learn from it. It's something we can learn from knowing how to pray. Interesting that this model was given because the disciples of Christ said, John disciples were taught by John how to pray. Would you teach us how to pray? It also tells us we don't know how to pray unless somebody teaches us. And that's somebody I would think would be God. Jesus Christ in the flesh in His earthly ministry taught us how to pray. Listen to what He says in this model in verse 9 beginning and going through verse 13. After this manner, follow the leader folks, therefore in the light of what you ask and what I'm doing, pray ye, that's a positive statement, pray ye, petition God, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, or in earth as it said here, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Then notice, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I think you have in this model because of the meaning of the word model. You have timeless principles contained in this model. It's as much a model now as it was a model when it was given. And it was given at the request of people saying, teach us how to pray. I think you'll see that it's not restricted to circumstances. 
which obtained exclusively before Christ went to the cross, suffered, bled, and died. And I'll show you why. Are we not to pray for our daily bread now, after the cross, <coughs> members of the church? No, we don't want to pray for that anymore. What about asking God to deliver us from temptation? Temptation here is the devil's way of soliciting us to violate God's law to engage in sin. Are we not to pray to be delivered from temptation? Strange that that's that way when you get over into John, or rather James, you have quite a bit written on how that we are tempted and how it works and when we sin as we go through the process of temptation. Was this something, are these things only applicable because Jesus gave it in his earthly ministry before he died? Even the request where he says, I, thy kingdom come, your kingdom come, can, can have a, can have a post-cross application. Well, the kingdom's here, isn't it? The kingdom is the church. The church is the kingdom. It was established on the day of Pentecost almost 2,000 years ago. So how I can't pray, following the model of prayer, explicitly, just so many words, I can't pray thy kingdom come because it's already come. I sure can pray for the kingdom. I can pray for the borders of the kingdom to spread. I can pray for the citizens of the kingdom. So that did fit when Christ was on earth relative to the kingdom because it had been established. But it still fits as a model teaching me I should pray for the kingdom. And if you're a member of the church, that's a citizen of the kingdom, and you pray for yourself, you're praying for you as a citizen of the kingdom <laughs> if you just prayed for yourself. So there's much to be seen in this. So we may conclude that Christians ought to pray. And guess what else is in this model prayer? Forgive us our trespasses. Can I not pray that anymore? If I can pray, deliver me from temptation. If I can pray for my daily bread, surely I can pray, forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. That's what... The Bible fully teaches in the letters written to Christians in several places regarding our prayer one for another. And this brings up then a specific case in Acts chapter 8. Acts 8, and that's the man who was in his alien condition, separated from God, lost in his sins, Simon the sorcerer. But he hears the gospel from Philip the evangelist, knows the message is from God, not from man, because Philip works miracles to confirm the word to be from God and not from man. And he hears the gospel and obeys it, becomes a Christian. But then not long thereafter, when the apostles had heard in Jerusalem that there were converts, the church had been established in Samaria, they sent Peter and John down there. There was a need for that because nobody could bring them a New Testament so they could study on their own to learn better how to live the Christian life. It wasn't in existence. So they sent Peter and John and they laid hands on the members of the church in Samaria that they might receive the miraculous gifts that took the place of the completed Word of God. Well, Simon didn't just want to work a miracle. Remember, he just didn't want one of those gifts. He wanted the power to confer those gifts. And that's when he was told that he was wrong and he was in sin. It's interesting to note that here's a sincere man. No reason to believe. Would you say he wasn't sincere? I absolutely know this man wasn't sincere. He can't say that. He didn't know any better. In his ignorance, maybe it's his background being a beguiler and a public magician. I mean, when he saw the real thing, he knew it. And he wanted it. And Peter said, you don't have any part in a lot in this matter. Told him that he had the wrong attitude and understanding about it. And frankly, if you read the passage, <laughs> he was scared. He was frightened. And he wanted to be prayed for that he not be cut off from God. So Peter told the erring brother, and that's what he was, an erring brother, to repent and pray. Why? That he might Enjoy forgiveness. Well, why would Peter direct Simon that he could be forgiven if he could not? In other words, he's committed a sin. That's clear from the text. 
But if you don't have to pray to God for forgiveness, why do the apostle, and remember they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, why did the apostle tell him he had to do that? So you see, if people read a little bit, they'd know their view of 1 John 1, 7, be wrong by saying from that, because blood continually cleanses those who are Christians, that we don't have to confess our sins and pray God for forgiveness. If they just read this, they would see that the apostle Peter told him that you've got to do this. You've sinned as a Christian. Here's the way you get forgiveness of this. So if Simon could not be forgiven, then really Peter's admonition to Simon mocks God. One well, might as well argue that no Christian ever needs to repent since the blood of Jesus continually cleanses him from sin. To argue for one is to argue for the other because neither one is mentioned explicitly in 1 John 1, 7. In, <clears throat> in Acts 8, 22, he said, repent and pray. Now, that's an imperative. It's what's called an imperative coordinate. you got to do both of them. The and connects them. One's as important as the other. Whether it comes after the and or before the and, they're on the same level of obligation. So it's an imperative that you do both of them if you're an erring child of God and you want forgiveness. Couldn't be clearer and it harmonizes completely with everything there is in the New Testament regarding a Christian who sins getting forgiveness of sins. Confessing our sins. Remember I said that James had something to say about this. Wasn't that many weeks ago we studied James and spent some time on that. And if you look at James 5, in verse 16, he says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There's a great lesson in just studying how am I going to be a righteous man and pray effectual fervent prayers. Because a righteous man who prays effectual fervent prayers avails much. Uh, what does that say about each one of us who is as faithful as we can be and praying effectual, fervent prayers? We will avail much with God and we'll get a lot done. That may say a whole lot about why a lot of us just don't have things going as they ought to. So, in James' letter, he talks about confessing one's faults and praying. He also speaks of converting a brother from error, thus saving his soul from death. Verse 20 of this same chapter. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. One of the first steps in a person's life when he's been caught up in sin, that he has changed, is that he confesses his sins. That's the sign that I have changed. I'm no longer in that condition. I recognize it's wrong. I recognize it was not God's will. I give that up. I no longer am involved in it. And I want you to know it. So I'm confessing that I was in sin. You see, this is a constant thing. Not just specific sins we do commit. Or secret sins or public sins. But it's a constant awareness that, hey, I'm not like that Pharisee who told God how happy God should be to have him. I fully realize I've got many things in my life that need to be covered by the blood of Christ, and I must stay humble and meek and admit it while I press on to stand for the truth and contend for the faith and preach the gospel to everybody. So I hope this tells us that while the blood of Christ, Christ continually cleanses the member of the church, the Christian, it is predicated on our being faithful or walking in the light. A part of which is when we sin, we confess our sins, having repented of them. And there's a constant realization in our general prayers, whether we have a specific sin in mind or not, that we are asking forgiveness for our sins because we are prone to sin. That's why man's in the mess he's in, is because he tends to like to have his own way and do as he pleases. I would suggest to you that the greatest enemy I have and you have in becoming a Christian and then in living the Christian life is that we like to have our way. Our will. And sometimes we get so blinded 
We think our will to do something our way is what the Bible teaches. Now that's when it's getting dangerous. When you have a David Brown 238 and you think it's Acts 238. Now you're in a mess. So that means you better be honest, sincere, learning how to write and divide the word of truth, and able to objectively apply the truth to your life no matter what it is. Or else you'll find yourself trusting in your own 238 <laughs> instead of God's 238, letting that stand for any authority anywhere on anything in God's Word. So let us learn to be humble. Let us be meek. That means the right attitude toward God and His authority, and the right attitude toward Christ our King is the only mediator between God and man. And think if we, if we didn't sin from time to time and need to confess our sins, why would you have the statement made of Christ that He ever liveth to make intercession for us? There wouldn't be any need for Him to intercede on our behalf if we weren't always in need of recognizing our weaknesses, our proneness to sin, no matter how much we hate it. I can't see a person who has lived many years in the church striving, as the Bible says, against sin, not to sin, to form the view of sin that God has, to hate sin and to love righteousness, who just sins all the time. But there's still the reality that I'm a human being and in need of the mercy of God and the grace of God as long as I walk on this earth. So I need the blood of Christ continually cleansing me from my sin. But it's predicated on what it means to walk in the light of season of life. And we saw at the beginning of this lesson, that's to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. That's why you have 1 Corinthians 15, 58 and like passages that teach us, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And wouldn't that cover also being faithful, involves confession of sins? If it doesn't, how do you harmonize these passages? We have to remain humble. We have to remain teachable. We have to build a state of where our heart's easily touched by God's will. We have a conscience that's easily pricked when we go astray. And we don't try to defend ourselves in our sins. We readily admit them. I think a great example of that is when Paul was in Antioch and Peter committed the sin that he committed there. And Paul immediately dealt with the matter as he did. You find many years later, Peter writing, even though Paul had rebuked him, and he said very plainly, of Paul, our beloved brother Paul. Now, you know, that's a pretty tough situation to have Paul withstand Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. He was playing the hypocrite by what he was doing. And yet you can think of Peter having that humble, contrite position I'm glad he showed me my error so I could come out of it. Think about that, brethren. That ought to characterize every one of us. That when error is in our lives and we don't know it, we don't see it, that someone can show it to us and we're thankful they did. I've often wondered, after the day that Nathan stood before King David, gave him that little story, when David uttered the judgment himself, on the man who took the poor person, poor person's little ewe lamb, rather than all the flocks and herds that he had to choose from, and became enraged. And Nathan said, Thou art the man. You ever wondered how many times David bowed before his God in prayer and said, I am so thankful that somebody loved me enough to point out my sin. And boy, look at those sins. Murder, adultery conniving and deceit and yet it all had to do with saving his soul and you know that blood shed on Calvary's cross that comes forward to cleanse us went right back there and cleansed David because he was faithful to the will of God that God had put him to at that time and God actually telling him you will not die I put your sin from you 
Brethren, that's a state we ought to want to be in. We ought to cultivate it. We ought to make sure we never have an attitude that says, well, you told me I was wrong. Something wrong with you. Well, it might be that somebody loved you enough to incur your wrath by telling you what you needed to do to be saved. If you're not a child of God, you must believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him as the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of your sins by His authority in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As a child of God, it doesn't guarantee you're flawless without need of growth. It means you're in a place where you can grow, where the blood will continue to cleanse you as you walk in the light as He is in the light. So you can grow in greater knowledge, greater practice of those things that characterize the godly people of the world. You need to repent of those sins and confess them and pray God for forgiveness. If need be, you're in that state. Then let this lesson and let the song we're about to sing encourage you to take care of those things in your lives that the Bible prescribes. And do so now while we stand and sing. <laughs>